Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, plunging ourselves immediately back into the lesson. We're talking about the transition between Joshua and Caleb, giving us an understanding of the transition between Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. And we want to see this. Joshua dealt with the entirety of Israel, did not select anyone out to be one of his generals or something to be set up above any, anybody else. But immediately when Caleb comes on the scene, he, he identifies with uh, Othniel and uh, begins to work with individuals. And uh, we see that this is the work of the Spirit of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, our Joshua, in chapter number 1 and verse number 8 of the book of Acts, the Acts of the Holy Ghost rather than the Acts of the Apostles, uh, says, but ye shall receive power, that is a double portion, uh, actually, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye, and, and I don't think that I understood this correct for many years, ye, I thought he's talking about the church, shall be witnesses unto me. I, I now know, and I can show you in just a minute, that I believe that's the Holy Ghost and the church. It doesn't exclude the church, but it doesn't exclude the Holy Spirit either. And ye, ye, the church and the Holy Ghost, shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. Chapter 5 of John and verse 29. Caleb began to deal with individuals. And that individual he dealt with became the first judge after the death of Joshua. And uh, we see the Holy Ghost starts dealing with me, and we read the last scripture this morning, was Acts 13, 1 through 4, separate unto me, Paul and Barnabas and so forth. Holy Spirit begins to call them personally to him. Acts chapter, uh, excuse me, John chapter 5 and verse 29, and shall, uh, shall come forth, is that what I want? Am I in the right chapter? Let's see. No, Acts chapter 5. I'm sorry. Acts chapter 5. I got it written down right. I just can't say it right with my mouth. Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, and to, and to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Now listen. And we are his witnesses of these things. And read me the next phrase. And so is also the, Holy Ghost. the key word in that phrase is also. That goes back to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Ye, that is you and the Holy Ghost, shall be witnesses. So... It's, it's a different age when our Caleb comes on the scene, when the Holy Ghost comes on the scene. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. Now, how many witnesses are in verse 32? We and also the Holy Ghost. That's how many? Two witnesses. Take that to Revelation chapter 11. We ain't going there now and it'll, it'll open it up for you. The two witnesses are not Moses and Elijah. It's, it's the church and the Holy Ghost. I got Bible on it. They got Schofield. I got the Bible. <laughs> Fooey on them. All right. All right. John, now John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Verses 26 and 27. Who are the two witnesses? The church and the Holy Ghost. No wonder we can't open up the Old Testament. We got the New Testament all screwed up. We're looking for Jesus, you know, in some millennium out yonder, and we're already in it. And uh, they got this thing chopped up in so many pieces, I didn't know what load I was on. They was going and coming three years, three and a half years, seven years. Man, I, rapture, rupture, I don't know. Man, and then finally I just said, I'm throwing all that stuff out and I'm just going to believe only what I read in the Bible. 
So I just started reading the Bible, crying out to God, and God said, it's, you know, it would be a whole lot simpler to stand on the ground and believe the truth than to climb a tree to believe a lie. It was a lot of work to believe all that stuff they had. But the Bible just says the two witnesses are the church and the Holy Ghost. All right, John 5, excuse me, 15, 26. John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye, next word, also. also. There it is again. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. And that wasn't just to the disciples you've been to meet with me from the beginning of my earthly ministry. That's all of you. You've been with him from the foundation of the world that the Father chose you in him. Isn't that good? Man, it just preaches. It just busts open like a ripe watermelon. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 3.16. I want to ask you a question when you get there. Are you ready? How much scripture is being talked about? All. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's the word God breathed. All scripture is inspired of God. The it comes, the inspiration comes from two words, the word God found in John 3, 3 and 5, and the word bloweth where he wills. The word bloweth, John 3, 8 is the other word, so it's a God breathed, God blowing book. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and dear soul, all scripture is profitable. And one of the things that God's doing for us on the backside of this cow pasture every service is reopening the scriptures to us and showing us the things that we've all been taught all of our lives. I'm not teaching you anything out of any Bible. Excuse me, I'm not teaching you from any different verses in, than what you've heard of the, uh, under other pastors all your life. God is just opening up the spiritual meaning of it to us. It's God breathed. God's blowing on it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and all scripture is profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for reproof. It's profitable for correction. It's profitable for instruction in righteousness that the, the man of God may be perfect and accomplished unto all good works, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's all you need is the God-breathed book. And the first thing that uh, Caleb does is conquer the city of the book. Now, uh, y'all remember Luke 24 because I'm fixing to do something and I'm going to try to come back to that. But a lot of times I lose that when I come back. Luke 24. All right, Second Peter, while we're over here, Second Peter chapter 1. And verse 20, <clears throat> Second Peter 1, 20. I want you to read one word for me. Knowing this, next word, first. first. What was the first city Joshua took? It was the city of the book. I want you to know this first. That no prophecy, now don't get all tore up about that word prophecy. It don't mean telling of future things. It means setting forth of that which God has put forth, preaching to us, declaring to us. Uh, forth telling is as much prophecy as foretelling. Did you get those words? Forth, F-O-R-T-H, telling is every bit as much prophesying as foretelling. I'm going to tell you something before it happens. That's not all there is to prophecy. But foretelling, telling you where you are right now in this day and age, is every bit as much of prophe prophesying as those who wrote this book and those who prophesied what would go on and told us that the days of, uh, at the end of the age would be as the days of Noah. Somebody's going to have to be down here at the end of the days of Noah telling you that it is the day of Noah. 
Listen, I'm not telling you anything that you haven't already known. But the Lord has given us an understanding of which way the Redeemer's going in our day, and we're going with him. I ain't following all this other modern-day fad. I want to walk with God. And it ain't going to do me no good to preach on Calvin's sermon on whatever. How many hairs in that horse's tail over in that Revel in the book of Revelation? If it's not relevant to our day and what God's doing in our day. Please don't get me wrong. I ain't again Calvin and, 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 and Spurgeon and all them guys. But they're so, you know, I didn't come to church in two-horse wagon. And Spurgeon did. This ain't the same day. It's, you know what? Gas in my granddaddy's day was 35 cents a gallon. He thought it was awful when it went up to 39 cents a gallon. It will be $5 for Memorial Day, they said. It's a different day and age, folks, and we need to know what God's doing in our day. So forth-telling, declaring to you, bringing forth the vividness of the Scriptures by the Holy Ghost is the work of the two witnesses, the church and the Holy Ghost. All right, let's read on. That no prophecy of the Scripture is of any of, of, is of its own private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God spake, and I might say only as they were moved, and that is born along by the Holy Ghost. So it's amazing to me that that big old four-syllable word over there that I have a hard time trying to pronounce, the hidden word meaning is the city of the book, and that's the first city that Caleb is said to conquer and to establish a base from where they were going forth. Now, Luke 24, right? Luke 24. Luke 24. <clears throat> Verse 29. But they, the two men on the road to Emmaus, constrained Christ, not knowing who he was, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent, and he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat, at food, at, at the meal with them, he took bread and blessed it, and blessed God, that which was on the inside come out. That's just like the Mount of Transfiguration. You can't hide Jesus. I mean, when he starts breaking bread and blessing it, everybody's going to know who he is. And uh, it's, it, he said, he took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us? Dear soul, when the gospel is being preached by the Holy Ghost, you get heartburn. While he talked with us in the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures. What scriptures did he open? Didn't have nothing but the Old Testament. What was it that, no, who was it that they saw when he opened the scriptures? The breaker of bread. And son, once you get that, the preacher dissolves. He vanished. And you went on your way rejoicing. Because now it's yours. Amen? All right. He opened to us the scriptures, verse 39. All right, but jump on over here to verse 44. This time he takes it and eats the fish. That kind of sounds good right now, anyhow, don't it? Good old fish fry. And he took it, verse 43, and he took it and did eat before them, Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. 
They memorized his words in their head, but now the Spirit of God is going to come to, number one, open to us the Scriptures in verse 32, and listen. These are the words that I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. That includes the whole Old Testament. Now listen. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. In verse 32, he opens the Scriptures to their hearts. But in verse 45, he opens their hearts to the Scriptures. This old God's name is Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. To know God is to know the Word, and to know the Word is to know God. But you can't know either one except God the Holy Ghost, who is the only true witness. You can't believe anybody except the Holy Ghost. You should prove every word that's preached to you by the Holy Ghost. If it don't sit right within you and the Holy Ghost quit saying amen, get out of there. Or if he's a brother in Christ, go get him and set him down and help straighten him out. Who was that straightened out old Apollos? Ananias and was it Sapphira? Who, who was that? Anyhow, they set him down and talked talk to him a more excellent way. But this all, listen. For you to understand that God has spoken to you today is a glorious thing. It's never been any other way for thousands and thousands of years. Moses standing there looking at a bush burning, scratching his head, and it's crackling and it's popping, but it ain't burning, it ain't being consumed. It ain't using the bush for fuel. It's burning fire of fire itself. And our God is a consuming fire, and he's standing there scratching his head. And when the, when the voice of God spoke, he understood, that's the same voice you got. David sitting in in the valley of Rephaim and the Philistines out there. And he said, last time, Lord, you told us to go hit them head on. What you want us to do this time? He said, fetch a compass, go around behind them. And he said, watch out for that sound of a go in the ankle chains that's in the mulberry trees. He said, I'm going to get the armies of heaven marching with you, so we're going to whip everybody. We're going to whip the demons and the Philistines. You don't have any different voice. That's your voice. God is preparing you the city of the book. He has raised this place up. It is for God to manifest himself to you. Amen. And I want you to understand, the one who's saying this to you is very scared when I talk like that because I don't want you to think that, 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 that I'm some Pharaoh pyramid builder. I'm going to use you and build a monument to my own self. No, dear soul. I, I want to be a Moses shepherd, lead you out of this mess that we've been in all these years. Amen. I am your soul servant. I am the helper of your joy. I know that you have faith, and by faith you stand. And I know, dear soul, that I need to listen to you as much as you listen to me because you say some glorious things to me to encourage my soul when I come down out of this pulpit. It's a blessed thing. It's amazing the shepherd gets the wool. Ain't that good? He don't get to hide. And I'm sick to death of preachers skinning sheep. I hate it. Listen. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And you read on down. We got to get back into our subject. But that it's just beautiful the way the first thing that he conquers is 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 a uh, is that city that means uh, the, the, the city of the book. Now, Othniel, I'm not going to drag you all over the place looking for Othniel. I'll just flat out tell you. Uh, his name means force, like in Air Force. Force, F-O-R-C-E, force of God. Anytime you see E-L in a name, Bethel, house of God. 
You know, El means God. So he's got Othniel, and Othni, best way I know how to say it, is force of, and El is God. So he, here comes the force of God conquering the city of the book, and, and, and the Holy Spirit comes and moves upon him, one who is of, uh, who, who is of Caleb's kin. Now, you're going to have a hard time with Othniel and who he is. In, in Joshua 15, 17, it sounds like Othniel is the son of Kenaz, and Kenaz is the brother of Caleb, and so that makes Othniel his nephew, and he marries him off to his daughter. So, he marries, so Othniel marries his cousin. But if you read Judges 1, 13 and Judges 3, 9, you're going to find out it says Othniel the brother of Caleb, not his nephew. I'm just telling you that the law didn't forbid even those two to marry, but you have to be careful how you read it here because it may not be Caleb's, in fact, I don't think it was Caleb's nephew. I think it was Caleb's brother. Based on Judges 1, 13 and Judges 3, 9. And we read you Judges 3, 9 earlier. But the thing about it is this. The first one who was, in whom it was manifest that he was a warrior for God in his glory under the anointing of the Holy Ghost was somebody that was kin to Caleb. There was a, uh, I guess I better show this to you. Matthew thirteen fifty five. There was a brother. Matthew thirteen fifty five. Sometimes I don't feel adequate to look at stuff. I'm scared I'm going to mess you up. But in Acts, excuse me, Matthew thirteen and verse fifty five. There's a listing of the half brothers. That is. Mary birthed them. Joseph was their father. Jesus was birthed by Mary as well, but his father was the Holy Ghost. And one of them's name was James. Matthew 13, 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? I'm not Hispanic, so I ain't going to say James and Jose. Joseph and Simon and Judah. All right, while we're here, Matthew chapter 12, just go back a page or so. Matthew 12 and verse number 46. While he yet talked to the people, that is, Christ was preaching, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto, them, unto him that told him, Who is my mother and my brethren? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hands towards his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Point. Here's what I'm trying to get at. The man that conquered the city of the book was kin to Caleb. But he wasn't chosen because he was Caleb's natural kin. He more or less had to step forth voluntarily and not really be chosen because Caleb said, whoever conquers this city, I'll give him my daughter. So he, he had to have the spirit of boldness and power and revelation of God inside his soul and he stepped forth and he had the goods to back up what he claimed so Caleb's nearest of kin was not selected because he was blood kin he was brought forth because the spirit of God was in him in so much as we've already showed you in Judges 3 9 he was the first judge in Israel after Joshua died Jesus says one of his brother's names was James. Now, this is not James Zebedee. Herod cut his head off. This is the half-brother of Jesus. You, you still with me? 
Galatians 1.19. Galatians 1.19. One of the things that I have found that has hindered greatly people who seem like at the, at the starting gate, they were going to cross the finish line before all of us. But they couldn't pass mama sitting in the stands. God said, if you don't love me in so much that your love for your mama seems like, hey, you can't be my disciple. You just ain't going to, it ain't going to work. He said, my disciples are not my blood kin, but my spirit kin. So Othniel was not just brought forth because he was kin to Caleb by blood, but he had a spirit of boldness and a uh, an ability to conquer, and it says he went out and conquered that city, and therefore he got that bride for his wife. Galatians 1.19. Okay, 18. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles, but other of the apostles saw I none except James, the Lord's brother. James now comes to be known as uh, a man in authority like an apostle who is the Lord's brother. Jump down to chapter 2 in verse 9. And when James, Cephas, it's another name for who? Peter. And John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands, the right hands of fellowship. All right. Again, this James is not James, J James Zebedee. This is James, the half-brother of Christ. Notice where he's mentioned in this verse. He's mentioned ahead of John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the man that was on Patmos, and he's mentioned ahead of Peter. On this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The faith that Peter was given. But his name came first. And knowing the uh, structure of the Hebrew mind as little as I do, I can't say as much as I do because I don't know much about it, but I know the Apostle Paul here was given these names in order of their supremacy in the Spirit and in the Holy Ghost. And James, it seems to be, was the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Jerusalem or the Church of Pentecost. He was a powerful man. But he wasn't powerful in the spirit like Othniel just because he was the Lord's brother. Neither was Othniel great and became a judge in Israel because he was Caleb's brother. But dear soul, your brothers have to be those who do the will of my Father which is in heaven. So I have more brothers here than if we was to have a family reunion. <laughs> you couldn't get that crowd together for a million dollars. There's all, I, I, I've got more brothers and sisters in Christ. And you know why? Because God will not allow us to go along the lines of Adam's bloodline for our families. It is done by the Holy Ghost. So you just well get ready to answer questions to your natural family as, why do you go over there, that church? There's plenty of churches around here you pass right by. You could be going here. And why don't you come to family reunions anymore? You, you say you can't miss church and you won't even come to family reunions. You're going to have to start giving account as to who your family is. And that's one of the witnesses that's brought forth. And you can't hardly explain it to them. It's like a, a butterfly trying to explain to a caterpillar how it feels to fly. You can't do it. They got to go through the metamorphosis themselves. But nonetheless, there is the situation. The city of the book is conquered. It becomes rich to us. It's the God-breathed book. It's not just religion. It's, it's, it's a spiritual revelation. 
It's, it's a glory attached to this word. The letter of the law killeth. It's the spirit of the word that giveth life. And remember, there's a difference between Bible and Scripture and the Word, the person, the truth. You can have the Bible and the Scriptures and not have the Word, the person, the truth. But you can't have the Word, the person, the truth without having a great love for the Scriptures and the Bible. Never seen it any other way. And that's the way it started out with these. Proverbs 18, 24. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. It's amazing how when brothers start out, they don't think anything's ever going to separate them. I saw three boys in the grocery store yesterday. They looked like stair steps, and they was whacking on one, one another. When the mom would turn their head, they'd bust the other one upside the head with a pack of post toasties or something and act like they didn't do nothing. I thought, yeah, one of these days, the power of the gospel can separate y'all so much that you won't even have any kind words to say to one another. Dear soul, this entire human race is going to be divided by grace. And God is going to have his family in his presence and the rest are going to be shut out. I know it's hard to think about it. But I want you to understand that Othniel is not a judge of Israel because he was kin to Caleb physically, but he's that one that's kin to the Holy Spirit that Caleb represented spiritually, and so was James, the brother of our Lord. I don't care if he's the seventh son of the seventh preacher son. And, you know, some folks seem like Grandfather's a preacher, so the daddy's a preacher, so the grandson's a preacher. Well, if God's in there, that's fine with me. I don't care. But I'm going to tell you one thing. It don't go along the natural blood natural bloodlines. It goes by the Holy Ghost. God will pick something that's, that's weak and base, offensive. God, that, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And he'll raise it up. And just, I told God a long time ago, I said, I don't care what it is that talks to me from your spirit. I want to listen to it. I don't care if it's a jackass like Balaam had to listen to or a rooster like Peter. It don't make no difference. And sent a man in here last Wednesday night. He was every bit as black as this Bible cover, but he had a golden heart, and every word come out of his mouth was edified and blessed, and we rejoiced together. It was glorious. It's the Lord, folks. It's the Lord. Oh, my soul. Listen. Now, what did he get? When Othniel, the force of God, captured the city of the book, then Caleb gave him Axa, his daughter, to wife. Now, her name is the same two words in Isaiah 3.18. And I won't make you look over there, tinkling ornament. You ever heard of an anklet? Well, in the East, women used to wear bracelets on their legs. That's the only thing I know how to tell you, on around their ankles. And when they walk, they'd make a, some racket. And, and according to ISBE, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, it says some of them learn how to walk wherever to make more noise. And I guess that's where the word pris pot came from. A little pris pot uh, prissing around here, uh, trying to make them ankle, anklets uh, tinkle so everybody will listen to her. She won't make music when she walked. All right. We didn't need all that, did we? I'm going to hear about that on the way home. Y'all pray for me. 
It's the truth. But anyhow, it's probably more than you wanted to know. That's what her name means. It means tinkling ornament. That's what he got. And let me show you. First Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. Let me spiritualize this so maybe I can have room in the car to ride home. First Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning. And that's all you need to hear. Wearing of gold. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament, the tinkling ornament, ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. Dear soul, God's true church is a beautiful woman. She stands with her husband. She backs him up everything he says. Jesus Christ, her head, her master, her Lord, she's not looking for and ladies, I ain't talking about anything you got on or what you look like today. I, before God, I'm trying to get you to the spiritual thing. The reward of the force of God, Othniel, was a chaste, spiritual, glorious, spiritually glorious, beautiful handmaiden. She was... She was uh, 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 complimented him these two became one spirit that's what the church is to the holy spirit he talks paul talks about being uh, like like a nursing uh, mother to you and it's it's amazing to see the intimacies and the tender revelations of the oneness of the spirit to the church. A lot of it you can't talk about because the world's so vulgar today, they can't, they, their ears are like garbage cans. You can't talk to them about it. But read the song of Solomon. I rest my case. But she was one that when she walked, it made music. And this old, when you walk before God, the eyes of God Almighty are upon you. You walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And you don't just have on those external ornaments of formal religion, and it's just not duty that you bring before your husband, but it is devotion. Right. And you are a sweet, savory smell of glory in his nostrils, and you are pleasing to his heart for Asaph. If I said her an axaph, she is a beautiful thing. That Othniel, the force of God, is glad to go out and, proceed, and, and, and proclaim for her and obtain for her the city of the book. Now, what does she ask for? We read it to you. She asked her husband to ask, and you can find this over in Judges as well, she asked her husband to ask her dad for a field. And evidently he, he kind of didn't ask fast enough or didn't ask. And she lighted off of her beast and Caleb saw that look in her eyes. And knowing his daughter all of her life, he said, what do you want? What wouldest thou? And I liked what she answered. Give me a blessing. Give me a blessing. A blessing. Now Caleb knew how beautiful that was because in chapter 14 and verse 13, and Joshua blessed him, that is Caleb. He had recently been blessed by Joshua. He had come back from, from absolute obscurity. No mention of his name at all. For all these campaigns, and then he shows up. He may or may not be received. 
he may be slandered and there could be jealousy and nobody want to admit who he was. But that's not what happened. The blessing included an acknowledging of him, of who he was in the Holy Ghost. The one thing I like about God's true church is when you come to your own, your own receive you. And it's not like when Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. But unto the pure, all things are pure. You don't need to tell me what mistakes you made in your life. Did you not hear Brother Gary this morning teaching us? If God has forgiven you, don't talk to me about that. Talk to me about the Lord. That's, we're going on. Forget those things which are about. I don't care what happened to you in the past that you feel like I ought to know about. Well, if you're going to get along with me, you got to know what I'm. No, 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 no. Because if you tell me all that, i got to tell you all my stuff. And I don't, I don't want to tell you all my stuff. It's worse than your stuff. But the blessedness of that oneness of spirit, and it, it's like music, the walking of the peoples of God, the tinkling ornaments, the beauty of the whole thing is the music that plays as she walks. It's, it's like a symphony orchestrated only by the Holy Spirit as all the peoples of God are walking and tinkling in the Holy Spirit, those tinkling ornaments of pure gold, of the meek and quiet spirits, and, and they are orchestrating an anthem of praise to the glory of Almighty God. And the crescendo gets higher and higher and higher until Jesus can't stand it and he comes back and gets us. Ain't that good? Amen. Glory to God. And he asked her, what do you want? And she said, I want a blessing. Well, first of all, explain to me what a blessing is in your mind. Two chickens in every pot, a Cadillac under every carport. I got land. I'm not worried about real estate. Give me springs of water. Would you be interested to know, and let's finish out with this, Zechariah chapter 4. That word springs I know Zechariah's in my Bible. There it is. Zechariah chapter 4. And verse number 2. That word springs is the same word in Zechariah 4, 2, with a bowl, B-O-W-L. And, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it. It's the same word in verse number 3. And two olive trees stood, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl. So the word springs is the same exact word in Zechariah 4 2 with a bowl and in Zechariah 4 3 a bowl. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about the two witnesses. You've got the church, which is the light of the world, the candlestick. But yet they need oil to burn and to burn brightly. And you don't have a 55 gallon drum mounted up here on a frame where gravity can pour oil into this thing through a, through a copper tube. What you got is two olive trees that begin to grow and prosper and produce oil forever and ever and ever. It just don't quit. You got the living spirit of God pumping life into the church so that we might be the light of the world. So her springs are the same things as these bowls she wants to amount to something in Israel. She don't want her land to be arid and dry and desert. 
And he says, because it, it pleased his heart so much, he gave her the mountain of streams and the lower streams. You remember how God broke up the fountains of the great deep? She got them too. And she's got water coming from above and water coming from beneath. And now she's able to be that witness, those bowls of oil, the springs of living water. We're going to get to that in just a second if I, if I can. And, 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 and here we have the candlestick uh, and the olive trees. It's, it's, it's of the Spirit of God. It's, it's pertaining to the revelation of God's glory among the inhabitants of the earth, the church, the light of the world, the Holy Ghost, providing the oil. The olives are constantly growing. They provide the oil, the olive oil. They never quit. The Holy Spirit has never quit. Your granddaddy's 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 granddaddy, if they were Christians, had the same Holy Spirit you got. Amen. Joshua died. Jesus died. But Caleb is still living, and he's got the strength that he had years ago. The Holy Ghost is still here. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and sending your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Don't we sing that? He ain't quit. He's not going to quit. He's not going to diminish. The glory of God is at stake, and it's centered inside of you. And he loves to hear when he sees that look on your face and you get down off your high horse in respect to him and get down to where he is and he says, what wouldst thou? He loves it when you say, give me a blessing that Jesus may be richly seen in my walk and in my talk and in my actions and in my motives. And let me be a fruitful field for the glory of Almighty God. And do it like you plan to do it over there in Zechariah about the lampstand giving out the light and the springs like the bowls on top. Uh, you know how they, they got all them stems going up. Got one lampstand and you got all these stems going up and there's a bowl on each top of it. And, and, and there's a, 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 two olive trees. Putting oil to that thing. And it ain't never going to quit burning. Isn't that good? L let's read it. Listen. So I answered, Zechariah 4 and verse 4. So I answered and spake to the angels that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? I like this. Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? Don't you like it when God says you have an unction and you know all things? He don't say, Well, stupid. In case you didn't know, he said, Thou knowest. You have an unction with the Holy One. And I said, No, my Lord. Now listen. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord. What city did he conquer first? The city of the word, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Christian, when are you going to quit trying everything but faith? When are you going to quit trying everything but Jesus? When are you going to give up on everything else and kneel and use your weapon of prayer and go before your Caleb and say, give me a blessing incorporate me into that which God has ordained from the very beginning that all glory should be in his son and I being in his son I am the reward of his warfare I am the woman with the tinkling ankle bracelets I am one walking in the spirit and making music as I walk in the spirit to the glory of almighty God give me a blessing let me fulfill the work of the Spirit while I dwell on earth. Let's finish with John chapter 7. You knew I was going there. John chapter 7. Get your song ready, Brother Norm. This is it. John chapter 7, verse 37. 
you understand there was processions, symbol playing, singing, all kind of stuff. There's great procession in, in all of this. It was going on. It was the last day, that great day of the feast, John 7, 37. There's a lot of noise. And all of a sudden, the last note was played and dead silence. Then Jesus spoke. Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture, the city of the book, I told you it was going to happen, it will happen. Not by might, it's not by power, it's not how much uh, clout the, the Catholic Church or the Southern Baptist Convention can get. It is by the belief and faith of the little people who want to walk with God. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers. Is that got an S on the end of it? Rivers of living water. And by the way, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper and his leaf shall not wither. He bring forth his fruit in his season. Dear soul, it ain't never going to fail. God's church ain't going to fail. If we just get in line with God and lined up with what, uh, what God said in the spirit and get out of what uh, the Southern Baptist said in religion or the sovereign grace will say in religion, if it ain't of God, throw it away, cut it off, get rid of it, and walk with God, we'll see this kind of flow again. Amen. Listen. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Have you believed on him? Then you will or have received the Spirit. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. The one thing that hinders the Spirit is the lack of the glorification of Jesus Christ. Don't ever do what you do for any other reason, as our brother read us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 this morning, except you do it for the glory of God. Let's get these juices flowing again. Let's ask for the springs. I don't mean come together and all of us have, you know, prayers printed out on mimeograph and say, you know, like, now lay me down to sleep. Pray. I, I don't mean canned prayers of the whole church. I mean, is anybody in here individually would like to know what it is like for one person to wholly and completely submit to God. Give me a blessing. What do you want? Give me a blessing. I want springs of water. I want high springs and I want low springs. I want God to be in every place of my life. Listen. Whether my way is in the low paths of the shade or in the high mountain sides of, of the sun shining upon me, I want God to be there and I want him to be flowing over me and through me. Listen, the washing of water by the word of God. You can't get away from it, can you? Every time you see the washing of, uh, of see the water, you see the word. Every time you see the word, you see the water. It's the spirit of the word, dear soul. Let's, let's, read, let's get on our faces, get on our knees and read our Bibles. Let's, let's read our Bibles in meditation before God and ask the Lord, Lord, what are you saying to me in my life?